difficult time. At best, it's kind of surreal. Uh, at worst, it's absolutely harrowing. And first, I just want to offer a prayer that everybody who is suffering from the virus uh, find their healing and may it be complete and very soon. And I offer my condolences to anybody who has suffered a loss, as so many have. Uh, I suspect that I've met a large number of you. I can see some familiar faces. Um, I met you whilst visiting with Hani and Levy and their family. So I want to say hi to old friends, and I want to say hello to new friends who are joining this program. I really want to keep this very, very fluid and take your questions, and I pledge and promise Scout's honor to give you honest answers and to be transparent. But before we do that, with your permission, I've asked Levy if he could play a short clip for us uh, that I want to just use as a launching pad for our larger discussion. So take it away, Levy. Bear with me while I get this started. Turmoil at home. With all the uh, strife and fighting overseas, it's easy to lose sight of the turmoil at home. There are hot spots here that are disintegrating into chaos as the world sits idly by. Wyatt Sinek traveled to Long Island and filed this report. We've all heard about the religious structure that's been enraging Manhattanites. Now with similar controversies to erect a religious boundary called an A-roof around West Hampton Beach. Each, a structure supporters claim will be harmless. It's just a religious freedom issue. And if your religion requires that Eruv, you should be able to do it. But for others, it's an aesthetic issue. It can totally transform the look of this town, which I enjoy. What does an Eruv look like, Charles? Basically, you wouldn't even see the thing. It's a matter... You wouldn't see it. You No, because it's a line. It could be a thin line running through the poles in the street around a whole area. It really is almost invisible. <laughs> yes, these beautiful seaside power lines will be ruined by this. Wait, this. Over here. See? What is the problem with letting them have a string around the town? It will attract many, many Orthodox Jews who want to break the rules of their religion. Oh, so so maybe the view he's talking about is less this and more this. The Orthodox want an Eruv because Jewish law prohibits performing daily tasks on the Sabbath. Everything from pushing a stroller to even carrying keys. To get around this, scholars came up with the Eruv. From the Hebrew word loophole, it's an invisible boundary which allows you to break God's rules. Like they say, what happens in Eruv stays in Eruv. If I were in an A-roof, can I kill a man? No. Oh, okay. If the string is virtually invisible, why not just pretend it's there? You can't say it's there and it's not there. If you're not involved, it's imaginary to you. But it's imaginary. It's real, but it's imaginary in a metaphorical sense. So it's really imaginary. It's not quite like Alice in Wonderland. It's more like Mr. Snuffleupagus? Uh... I went to West Hampton Beach to save the town before it became a lawless Wild West bank. You know, it, it, it allows to and it's okay. But first they start pushing their kids, next they start pushing their orthodox agenda. I think that people just need to be more open-minded and I think it'll all work itself out. I'm not worried about the era of really. Restaurants like this bakery are going to have to become kosher. This bakery's already kosher. It's already begun. And what's most shocking are the hardball tactics the Orthodox are using against the established Jews. One of them tried to explain to me very loudly <laughs> that she could not shop on the Sabbath. And then I said to her, take your grosser tuchus, which means very large behind, outside of my store. That's just seems rude on their part. Exactly. They are a very closed-minded little group. That's why Charles and the other open-minded Jews created an organization to keep Orthodox Jews out of their town. 
Whatever you all are doing, it has to be horrible. You made a 73-year-old Jewish man complain. I envy him because if that's the only thing he's got to complain about is that fishing line up there, boy. There had to be a way to bring peace to this troubled land. Perhaps a compromise. An air of hat? Yeah, look, huh? Got myself a nice little bacon sandwich and a glass of milk. Check me out. Oh. Hmm? Watch this. Look at me. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, That's delicious. Even if you had an error from here to California, you can't eat that. It's ironic that both groups with 4,000 years of shared history were choosing to ignore tradition. Charles, we should keep the Hamptons the way they're supposed to be. Christian. Well, I totally disagree with that because the Hamptons are for everyone. Except, apparently, these folks. Yes. We are against their little group taking over our way of life. And the best way to protect your way of life? Make sure Orthodox Jews can't practice theirs. Didn't pass your vehicle emissions All test? Up. You can get up to 550... Thank you, Levy. Uh, I played that clip for you because I believe that it can highlight in a humorous way some important truths, not the least of which is that context is everything. So in the little clip you just watched, the secular Jews of the Hamptons, not all of them, of course, but at least Mr. Goldberg, they understand their neighbors, not at all. What they do know with certainty is that they don't want them near them. Now, unfortunately, the brouhaha over the Arab and the Hamptons was not the first and will likely not be the last time such conflict occurs. Bottom line is, we don't want them near us. But what's really interesting is that America, Jews, and even non-Jews seem to have a fascination with Hasidim from a fashionable social distance vantage, of course. Uh, so Stiesel is exhibit A, and now, of course, we have an Orthodox. Now, of course, there's a very, very big difference. Stiesel is a sympathetic treatment of this strange demographic, but you could get into the storyline, while an Orthodox is a, um, is a pathos-filled story of escape from the stronghold of Hasidic life in Williamsburg. The other big takeaway from the Arif sketch, and this is huge, is that without understanding the meaning and the larger framework of any particular ritual, it's easy, very easy, to come away with the impression that it's simply bizarre or just plain cuckoo. But as every good anthropologist knows, in order to study and understand a community, you have to go deeply to the core. You have to understand the particular values and life perspective of your subjects Otherwise, your study of particular rituals and nuances is meaningless. It's just nonsensical. So my intention in this uh, time we have together today is to take your questions about particular aspects of Hasidic life as depicted in the miniseries Unorthodox and answer them to the best of my ability. I understand that people are curious to know to what extent art actually imitates life. Um, but allow me to just preface with some additional contextual points, because like I said, context is everything. Number one, it's important to understand that Hasidic Jewry is not a monolithic de demographic. There are many, many subsidiary sects. There are many similarities, but there are also many differences. And interestingly enough, the sharpest differences among Hasidic sects actually exist between the Chabad Lubavitch Hasidic sect, of which I am a proud member, and the Sopmer community depicted in Unorthodox. Having said that, there is much that all observant share, all observant Jews share, and I mean across the board from the most modern Orthodox to the most insular Sopmer. So full disclosure here, I'm not a Sopmer Hasid, I've never lived within that community. I do, however, have insight into that community both through my own background and through relatives and acquaintances who actually live there. 
The second thing I want to uh, state is that it's extremely important that viewers understand that Deborah Feldman's story. Um, so, the, so first there was a book, and then this miniseries is loosely fashioned or inspired by the book. It's a very specific experience. It's one woman's experience, which included some and includes some very unfortunate personal circumstances. What the book and the miniseries fail to depict, of course, is the deep beauty, the love, the sense of purpose and mission that pervades Hasidic life. The tangible relationship with God that informs the everyday, the richness of the life cycle events, the holidays, and in fact, every day. The vast majority of the Satmar community, while not living lives like you or I might choose to leave, live, lead happy and meaningful lives. This is true, I might add, for women just as much as it is for the men. I know that women are classically depicted as baby-making machines with nary a scintilla of brain matter or of self-autonomy. I can even understand how many of the scenes depicted underscore this perception. But living as an observant Hasidic woman myself, who also self-defines as a feminist, I can tell you that the mini-series, like many other treatments of the observant group, and certainly Hasidic community, just doesn't really give the viewer the chance to truly understand, like I said, the larger context. This point, I might add, has been made in numerous articles by people who themselves left the Satmar community. So it's not like I feel like I have to get on this um, little Zoom thing uh, for Levi and Khani and their immediate best friends and um, you know hold up the flag for our way of life. It's not that at all. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak about my life for those that are curious. Um, and to speak about the show, which I have to say, um, in part, I enjoyed and in part, I recoiled from. Um, but what was most important to me was that in reading articles about the show was that indeed people who had left that very same community confirmed that feeling I got that the show does not capture the heart and soul, the profundity and the sheer humanity of the community. I have to say um, that for me, the most arresting scene comes very close to the end when Yankee, as a show of tremendous commitment and love to Esty, cuts off his payout, his um, earlocks. In this scene, I felt like the viewer finally got a glimpse into the inner landscape, the deep emotion, Hasidim, like all people inevitably feel. For much of the show, the characters, with the exception of Esty, of course, are depicted as wooden caricatures. Um, so at this point, those were my uh, preparatory remarks, and I'd happily take your questions. And the only thing I do want to say is, please, please, I say this to anybody I ever speak with or um, study with, there is no question that is a bad question or a stupid question. The only bad question is a question that remains unasked. Um, this is a no holds barred session, so feel free to ask whatever you want to ask of me, and don't worry, I will not be offended. Um, so I'm going to share the screen here so I can look at the chat. Um, no, that's not helping. Lavy, help me tell me what to do so I can see the questions. So first of all, there are no questions on there yet. All right, but, then you uh, just have to be intrepid and uh, unmute I yourself. Okay, so I didn't unmute anyone yet. We'll do that in a minute. But uh, in the meantime, if anyone does have a question they wanted to type out, I do have a question from Facebook that somebody said, given the scene in the mikvah were Hasidic men permitted to watch this? Um, I, I'm okay. not sure if that question is about watching the actual show or actual mikvah. I asked for a follow-up on that. They didn't reply. It seems to me that the questioner is asking, would a Hasidic man be able to watch a scene of a, of a nude woman effectively immersing in a mikvah? Um, the answer to that, of course, is no, he shouldn't be watching nudity. Um, in general, Jewish law puts great premium on uh, both men and women being 
discerning and discriminating about what they watch, about what um, impressions you're taking in, because a lot of these impressions make an indelible mark on, on our psyche, on our brain. So both for men and women, it's important to monitor uh, you know, what we're seeing. I think this is especially true for men. Uh, Jewish law acknowledges that men and women are sexually aroused in different ways um, and that the visual and tactile stimulus might be all the more um, acute in the male and therefore they have to be especially careful with what they're taking in. Okay, um, for you to see the questions, you would have to hit the chat button on the bottom of your screen. In the meantime, I'll just read that. Um, I don't see a chat button. Move your mouse. Ah, yeah. I saw it. But I do see you that. Know, I'm technologically challenged. So I see two questions that just came up and I'll just share those. One of them, two questions were the same. Basically, if you can explain the differences between, one was how many different Hasidic sects are there? And the other one was to explain the differences between Haredi, Satmar, and Chabad. There hmm. seems to be many differences. And then, okay, all right. Um, I admit that I cannot give you a comprehensive number uh, or a definitive number on Hasidic sects. Um, there are definitely some major Hasidic sects, but then there are a lot of much smaller ones. Um, it just happens to be that I know more about various Hasidic sects than most classic Chabad women might know because a lot of these, my parents are both not from uh, Chabad families going way back when. Um, and both from my father's side and from my mother's side, I'm related not only to a lot of Hasidim and other sects, but also to the Rebbe's who actually um, lead these, these groups. Um, so I could tell you that there are a lot of a lot of different groups and a lot of splinter groups within them, but I would say the major players are certainly Chabad, uh, Satmer because of the sheer volume, Bells, Babiv, uh, Pupa, Vizhnitz. Those are really the big groups, and Buyan has now emerged as a larger group, and then you have just so many, probably another 30 to 50 very small Hasidic groups, subsidiary yeah. groups. Um, as far as the difference between, so let me explain the term Haredi. Um, there's been a long and arduous uh, debate in uh, American Jewish press and otherwise about how the press should refer to People they love to prefer they love to refer to as ultra orthodox. Okay, uh, the um, many of the ultra orthodox community have felt that that term is in and of itself derogatory. Ultra anything just doesn't sound good. So a lot of the press have adopted the Hebrew word Haredi, uh, which literally means those who tremble. And it's a reference to anybody who is, <laughs> I think, truth to be told, ultra-Orthodox, as opposed to being more modern Orthodox. Now, Haredi is an umbrella that would include both Hasidic Jews of all stripes and colors, of which there are many, like I said, and also the more Lithuanian uh, demographic, otherwise referred to as yeshivish or misnagdish. So I hope that that helps. One thing I've made clear, we Jews are complicated and we love to divide and subdivide and subdivide and subdivide, but we're really all the same bottom line. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was very fond of reminding us that we're all just one family. Uh, despite ready? all the external differences. Do you see the chat now or do you want me to read out questions to you? Uh, Ah, I could see the chat, so let me go to the top. Oh, okay, good. We have questions, that's for sure. Okay, how many sects are there? I'd love for you to share the article. I will uh, I will give Levy links to the articles and he could send them out. Somebody wants me to share the links to the articles. Why are the women not permitted to further their education? Um, well, 
if you're talking about within the Satmar community, it's both men and women uh, who are not getting a lot of secular education. But if anybody's getting more secular education, it's the women rather than the men. Um, and I think that this might be a good question that we can use as a segue into understanding a little bit more of that, about that community. Um, the community really built itself from the bottom up after World War II in America, uh, very much based on the premise that they had to circle the wagon, live very insular lives, and only in that way could they replenish their numbers and rebuild what had been destroyed in the Holocaust. And so I think that that might just be their supreme value. And so not engaging in a lot of secular education is uh, one very important way to keep the rest of the world at bay. Now, having said that, you're not talking about an Amish community. Uh, they really know how to use technology to the hilt. Uh, they don't shun medical treatment and so on and so forth. But you're probably not going to see a lot of professionals come out of that community. You're going to see a lot of um, teachers and uh, ritual scribes. And you're going to see a lot, a robust business industry. I'll, you know, it's not like these people are not very, very smart or intrepid or entrepreneurial. They are. And they're very, very successful. Uh, so I hope that that uh, helps with the education uh, question. Are the couple's sex lives such an open book? No, I mean, like much else, you know, when you, when you watch a show, it, you know, I, it, there's, there's drama. Um, no, I don't think the sex lives are an open book. I think that if a couple was going to have a difficulty in their intimate lives, I would hope they would, and I think that most would turn to someone they trust, but it's not like this is going to be a discussion at the dinner table or that even every mother-in-law is going to be involved to the extent that this mother-in-law is depicted as being involved. I heard from relatives back east that the Hasidic communities have not been social distancing. Is that so? A comment to you. Thank you so much for your honest presentation. Well, thank you, Janet. Um, unfortunately, much to my chagrin, um, there is definitely more than a modicum of truth to that. It's not all of the Hasidic communities, uh, but there have been pockets that have been especially stubborn. Um, not that this makes it any better, but we saw similar things with certain communities around Easter uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not proud of it, and I am vociferously opposed to that kind of behavior. I could try to explain why that might be so, um, but I don't know if that's important to take your time doing so. But yes, that's that's unfortunately been the case. At the same time, uh, most of the communities, the Hasidic communities, have been following the law, have been, have been socially distancing in proper manner. And uh, I think it's important, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to show that clip, because it's so easy to buy into the caricature and to buy into uh, the negative stereotypes. And much fewer people will do stories about the Hasidic people running around Manhattan, giving out masks to people of all religions, all faith communities, and many with none at all, um, to people actually paying for more than 1,000 tablets and bringing them to hospitals so patients could connect with their relatives because in New York, you weren't able to go into the hospital with anybody and people didn't know if the relatives were alive or not. It was terrible. And that was another terrible thing heaped on to the, to the, to the suffering with the virus. Um, there's just so much uh, kindness, so much untrammeled good that happens in these communities that unfortunately is never highlighted. Um, so I think, I think that's important to understand. Mm -hmm. How much does a mother-in-law pressure a daughter-in-law? <laughs> you know what? In every type of community, in every type of society, you know, this is an old thing, probably from the first mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, there can be some, just a little bit of tension, or it can really become more exacerbated. I don't know that it's a particularly Hasidic thing. <laughs> 
Uh, but what is definitely clear is that in the Hasidic lifestyle, I think that's true in general in Jewish communities and generally in observant communities and in other faith-oriented communities, family is everything. So of course, um, that's gonna be very prominent in their lives. And building those families is going to be very, very important to the larger community and to the self-construal of both the males and the females in that community. So would I go as far as saying that no mother-in-law would be this callous or this meddling? No, that would be idiotic for me to say. I'm sure that there are some who are. But like, like I said, I think that's just across the board. Uh, but in other communities, it might be about something else, and that community would be about building a family. Do Stopmers still discourage their women from getting higher education like other Orthodox or otherwise Jewish groups? Um, I think that probably with the passage of time, there's been some, uh, let's just say, softening in stance. But I think generally speaking, for both men and women, higher secular education is not a great value in that community. But if anybody was going to have a higher secular education, it would be the woman rather than the man. Um, and that's true even of the education they're giving on a primary and high school level. Um, there was a comment at the beginning of the series that reproduction was very important due to her loss of the Holocaust. Why is it so important to reproduce with as many children as possible? Um, why is it so important to reproduce with as many children as possible? Um, so while in, in, while in the Satmar community, there might be a particular um, emphasis on replenishing our people after the Holocaust, uh, because the Satmar community was almost completely annihilated um, due to the Holocaust. Different Hasidic communities had different experiences. Some were completely destroyed, uh, some less so. But I think generally speaking, um, amongst very observant Jews, whether they're yeshivish or Hasidic, having large families is simply a statement of what is valued most. Uh, so while in other communities, there might be other um, principles or guiding values, in a Jewish community, uh, the, the gift of being able to bring another soul into this world, of being able to bring another sliver of the divine, is considered um, the most important mandate and the greatest privilege, in fact. Now, of course, this is not something everybody can do. This is not something everybody should do if there are either physiologically or psychologically based concerns about having a large family. But given uh, the possibility to do so, this emerges as a tremendous value. And that's not distinct or specific to Satmar alone. Is it really this difficult to leave the sect as it is depicted in the film? It's a very, very good question. Um, I think the difficulties are really much more internal than they are external. It takes a lot to leave that kind of community because of what's not depicted in the show. Uh, like I said, the tremendous feeling of connection and safety and warmth and meaning and beauty. That's not something that everybody has. And so what we see is that most of the time, I won't say all of the time, but most of the time people leaving these types of communities are leaving because something is broken in the personal connections. And um, this, is, this is a very, very sad subject, and it's not one that I speak of without a tremendous amount of trepidation and pain. But very, very often, like was Deborah Feldman's experience, um, taking leave of the community has a lot to do with a feeling of anomie, where I can't find myself. I haven't found my connection. I feel other. I don't feel a part whether it's due to some type of abuse that has been suffered, whether it's due to the brokenness of her particular family in this case, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm not saying that there isn't anybody that leaves on theological grounds or philosophical grounds, but that's a very, very, very minute percentage 
Um, so I think the difficulty of leading is much more internal than it's external, you know. Um, I think what they wanted to do here was evoke the Arov line around Williamsburg as kind of this Berlin Wall. But in fact, um, most of Williamsburg doesn't even know it's there because most of the community in Williamsburg does not accept that particular Arov or any Arov at all. Um, so it's not even a thing in their life. You know, that was kind of like an artistic attempt. Um, the community will, though, do everything it can to hold on to every child. That is true. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, that will boomerang because it won't be done in a way that's really effective. Um, I'm not here to tout one particular lifestyle over another, but I, but I will say um, that Chabad, like every other community, uh, has its share of children who have left. Um, and something that's very, very distinctive about the Chabad philosophy is that no matter what the child does, no matter what the trespass, or the religious transgression, they will always have a place at home. And this is not an easy thing. It's a difficult thing because like I said, family is so important. Raising the family with particular values is so important. If it's problematic for a man to see um, a half nude woman immersing in the mikvah, it's much more problematic for young children to see an older sibling flagrantly violating the Sabbath or eating um, very clearly non-kosher food. And so you can imagine this creates tremendous angst. Uh, but overall, it's really the community stance that these children still remain very firmly tied and tethered to the community through love. Um, can you comment on the rules of the mikra from a feminist perspective versus the notion that reinforces the view that women are dirty and the natural process of the woman cycle? Um, Sherry, you know, asking me that kind of question is just asking for a whole lecture, which I can't give right now. Uh, but mikva is uh, a subject of great interest and passion for me. But I will say as succinctly as I can, um, that this is just yet another example of how easy it is for rituals and rites to be misunderstood. And nobody can be faulted for misunderstanding without, proper, um, without the proper opportunities to study. Uh, so mikvah is part of a much, much larger biblical construct that deals with ritual purity and impurity. And this is true for men and women. And it has nothing to do with physical dirt or anything that lessens the status or the stature of a person. Uh, but in Jewish life, ritual purity and impurity, while not something you can see with the naked eye, are very, very real. Um, they're, they're realities. And in temple times, uh, this was paramount in every Jew's mind because to enter the temple, as it were, or even to step onto Temple Mount, you had to be in a state of ritual purity. And you could fall into a state of ritual impurity uh, in many, many ways. All of them share one common denominator, and that is through interface with death on some level. Okay. Uh, so the last two things I'll say is that when a woman menstruates, there's a loss of life, as it were, a loss of potential life, which puts her into a state of ritual impurity. And while the physical temple is, alas, not in existence today, uh, most people refer to this time as the post-temple period, but we in Chabad uh, like to refer to this as the pre-temple period. Uh, but in any case, we don't have the physical temple clearly today. But in terms of our personal lives, our bedrooms, and our marital beds and intimacy is the holy of holies. And entrance into the holy has always been predicated on ritual purity, which can only be achieved via immersion in the mikvah. So I think once people understand this, there's a whole different perspective here. Um, and I could speak about this for many, many hours. Uh, but if you're listening, then you understand that sexuality is so central 
and so holy and therefore necessitates being in a certain place spiritually, which is what mikvah is all about. It's about spiritual ascension, transformation, elevation. Why the extreme separation? The sexes, I went to a funeral in Williamsburg and even the entrances are separate. It seems to be much fear of behavioral control. Okay, this is a very important and interesting question. Again, it begs for a much longer, more nuanced discussion. Um, I think the point of departure here is to understand that the relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife, is seen as holy and irrevocable. That's not to say that divorce is against Jewish law. It's not. Um, and that's not regarded as something that's not an option. But if the couple loves each other, are committed to each other, want to stay together, their bond has tremendous potency. And therefore, there's much in Jewish law that seeks to nourish and nurture the viability and the strength and to um, try to weed out any circumstances that can erode at that bond. So there isn't a lot of social intercourse between men and women in Hasidic communities, generally speaking. That's not to say they'll never speak to each other, but they're not going to just kind of hang out. And um, when there are large public events, the men and women do pretty much uh, enjoy those events or experience those events separately. So it is very different than the general population. It is, I can understand, very jarring. Um, but it's part of a larger communal value that seeks to really uh, keep the relationships between men and women respectful and proper and it, there's not a lot of room for a more casual kind of relationship. Now, here you see a very, very strong divergence between a Hasidic community and a more modern Orthodox community where this would not be the case at all. So this is kind of one of the defining features, I would say, at least one of the more external defining features. Uh, we have Another question, but I think I've already answered it. I don't think most Satmar women are encouraged to pursue education to become doctors, engineers, or lawyers. Uh, but I think in a lot of other Hasidic communities, there's a lot more, uh, you know, leg room and leeway for that. In unorthodox, when Yankee cuts his payouts in a show of love for Esti, didn't he just shorten them rather than cut them off? That's an astute question, Stephen. Um, but you have to understand that for Yankee, that was probably more painful than cutting off his right arm and gouging out his left eye. Because for a Satmar man, that's a hallmark of uh, his allegiance to God, his adherence to Jewish law. Okay, so as you can see, Levi Levertov doesn't have those earlocks because it's not the Chabad custom, but in the Satmar custom, it's very, very important. Uh, so while, yes, he was just shortening them, and he was cert most certainly within the confines of Jewish law, for him, it was probably the ultimate expression of what he was willing to do to stay with her. Um, I'm, I'm going I, 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 I'm to just share something with you that I think can be helpful. Because I think a lot of these questions are about, I'm going back to that question of the extreme separation of men and women. Yes, yes, it does appear very extreme. And I have to say that I've gotten this question in so many different iterations uh, about my lifestyle. Um, there are things that are kosher, but it's not, it's not within our custom to eat those things because in addition to being kosher, we want it to be according to this standard or that standard. And people will always be like, why can't you just live a little? Like, just like, why does it have, why does it be so difficult? Why does it have to be so exacting? And the subtext really is extreme. Why are you so extreme? And it occurs to me that um, there are people who will spend four, five, six hundred dollars on a bottle of wine. And you would call those people connoisseurs. And if somebody spends $300 on a round of cheese, they're a gourmand. 
$5 billion on a piece of art. Oh, well, they're a patron of the arts. $3,000 on the last ticket to a baseball game, aficionado. Do you see where I'm going? There's a positive term for anybody who's passionate about something, and there's a respect. It may not be my thing, but they're passionate about wine, and they're ready to spend $600 on a bottle. But I've noticed that when it comes to religion, anybody who seems to show a modicum of passion above what seems to be the norm, and remember, for everybody, the norm is something else. So if it's a little bit more extreme than my norm, oh, they're crazy. There are no positive words for somebody who's so passionate about their observance that yes, they would suffer a little bit more uncomfortability or lack of options of ice cream or places to eat and so on and so forth. Um, and that I think was what people were rebelling against when they didn't want that term of the press, ultra orthodox. What do you call somebody who works out every day? Ultra fit? No. Nobody would call them ultra fit. They would just say, oh, she's so fit. She's really enthusiastic about working out. You see what I'm saying? Okay, I'm getting off the soapbox. I'm going to look to your questions. Um, I was asked by someone the following, women's shaving head isn't Torah. Why isn't it optional for their community? It's harsh and extreme. Okay, I agree with you. It is harsh. It is extreme. And from what I understand, it's not optional in the Satmar community. Um, but you're right. It's just another example. It's not Torah. Nowhere in the Torah does it say a married woman has to shave her head. It does say a married woman should cover her head, but she could keep her hair long, as long as she wants, under that covering. Okay? The Satmar tradition has evolved in that the women shave their heads. And I imagine um that for some young women this is very difficult but as as shocking as this might sound to you i imagine that for others it's not only because they've been conditioned in this direction from a very young age so i don't i don't know if you if i don't i don't know if you remember that scene where Estes hair is shaved off but you remember there are three young cousins in that scene and that's not by happenstance so I suspect their mother, Esty's aunt, wants them there to see so that it won't come as a shock. It's something that they expect. It's something that can either be seen as a shocking violation of the self or as a stepping into one's new role, you know, as kind of like a rite of passage. Again, it's all about context. Um, now, if you want to know why they would do that, I can give you two reasons. One is because... Uh, Covering the hair very carefully is extremely important in all ultra-Orthodox communities. Certainly in the Hasidic tradition, there's also a mystical overlay as to why the hair has to be covered so carefully. So if you shave the hair, <laughs> there's no possibility the hair will be exposed. Is this extreme? Yes, but I'm trying to give you the reason. Um, the other reason is because when a woman goes to the mikvah, it's very important that the waters of the mikvah envelop every part of her body and that not even one strand of her hair flow to the top of the water. Again, if you shave the hair off, you're not going to have a problem. Again, is this extreme? I concede, yes, it is. But again, that's their custom. Do you feel like any other fictional depictions of the community that are more accurate? Do I feel that the show has raised awareness in a positive way for Judaism overall? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I fear that um, it just is yet another opportunity um, for people to further misunderstand um, and for them to fixate on things that they are really already believe true about these communities, including um, how women are treated and so on and so forth. And so when you take this um, poor Esty and you put her in a position where it seems that she has so little agency over her own destiny, unless she actually takes flight, you just, you know, kind of underscore 
you know, a depiction, which I think it's, it's too simplistic because even in the Satmar community, which is so much more insular than the Chabad community, let's say, it's like literally two different worlds. But even so, I know from personal experience, there are very powerful movers and shakers that are female in the Satmar community. Um, so this kind of show doesn't do much to um, shine light on the nuance and, and the complete truth about these communities. And I'm not sure that there are many positive takeaways in a show about a young woman who breaks loose of a constricting, demeaning lifestyle. So I, I yeah. Are there really Moshe's, a person who will hurt you will hunt you down if you leave community to bring you back. Um, Moshe was a very compelling figure, I have to say, very, very interesting. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that every single person in the Satmar community or the Chabad community for that matter is the paragon of virtue um, and might not have an addiction to one or two things uh, like Moshe had to gambling apparently. Um, I can tell you that there's no one in the Chabad community <laughs> commissioned to hunt down children who have gone astray. Um, I don't think there's anybody quite like that in the Satmar community, but I think that there are some vociferous attempts made uh, to bring children home. I think that scene where they stake Esty out outside of the conservatory uh, it's basically a, like from a hit movie. Um, I, I don't know that that actually happened to anybody. Um, but I think that they would spare no resource um, in trying to bring a child home. I think that is true. But I, but I think he's kind of an especially uh, colorful figure. Um, again, are there Hasidic men who have gone to brothels who have you know, been with prostitutes, I'm sure that that's true, um, 100%. You have everything in every community. Uh, several years ago, while in Tel Aviv, we attended a Friday night service and were invited to stay for dinner. The lovely young woman sat with me and proudly explained that they were happy working outside the home while their husband studied and took care of the children. A surprise to me and a contrast to the stereotype. Well, Janet, I'm glad you had that experience and that you had a myth busted for yourself. So in fact, um, this is very, very common in the other part of the Haredi community, the more Litvish or Yeshivish paragon, where men, many of them, study for many years. And the women, in addition to mothering very large families, are also the breadwinners. And uh, in fact, uh, this has emerged as somewhat of a bone of contention in these communities um, of late, especially because the women are interfacing with the larger world. Um, they're getting advanced degrees. They are very savvy. And, uh, and sometimes there's a disconnect um, between themselves and their husbands as a result of this. Although it seems that um, for most, this works. The women really value the fact that their husbands are studying Torah. And uh, they do really lead remarkably busy lives. They really are super women. So, you know, the nine to five, five to nine on steroids, because, you know, this is not your family of 2.5. This is very typically a family of 10 to 14 children. And still the mother is the primary breadwinner. Uh, so that's, that's a very interesting paradigm that's called the Kolel uh, paradigm. And uh, it exists in New York, in, in America as well, but it's really um, prevalent in Israel. It's not for everyone. Can a person move from one sect to another sect in his or her lifetime? For example, moving from ultra-Orthodox sect to a modern Orthodox sect. Okay, so first of all, anybody can do anything they want. Uh, the defining feature of the human being is that we have volition, that we have freedom of choice. Uh, so anybody can do anything. Um, I've never heard of modern Orthodox life referred to as a sect. Uh, that's much more reserved for the distinguishing between the various Hasidic groups, often called sects. Yes, um, there are people who have moved from um, Satmar 
for other Hasidic sects to more modern Orthodox lives from Chabad as well. There are people who have moved from modern Orthodoxy to Hasidic sects. Um, I think that uh, if, if this is something you're interested in and you've been like reading books by people who have left the Hasidic community, most of them, not all, but the vast majority are people who have left midst a lot of personal um, angst and bitterness. Uh, but there are other voices out there, more moderate voices of people who still continue to be in loving and constant communication with their families, uh, but who have moved to a more moderate iteration of observant Jewish life. So these are all possible modalities to be sure. Can you explain how they decide what their garb, including the men's hats, et cetera, per sect? Uh, I see there's a number of questions here. I'll take one at a time. Uh, so the garb. So as far as I've been able to determine through my um, speaking with people and other research, uh, the garb of Hasidic men most often mirrors uh, what the nobility of their geographic location wore. And that's what um, the Hasidic men would wear for Shabbat or Jewish holidays. And so I, I'm not really very steeped in this, but some people uh, can tell you what kind of Hasid they're looking at by looking at their shoes or their socks. I kid you not. It's not even the hat and it's not even the coat, just the socks and the shoes. There are iterations and nuances and variation. This is not an area of focus for me. Um, but from what I could tell, it's um, fashioned after the garb of the nobility in different areas of Russia, um, uh, Poland, and so on and so forth. I will say that that's for Shabbos. And for the everyday, most Hasidic sects, with the exception of Chabad, uh, have the men wearing longer coats uh, during, during the week as well. Um, and I think there you have a combination of wanting to be conservative, therefore the black and white, um, and not you know, calling a lot of attention to detail or color and so on and so forth. Um, and the longer coat might be a way of, of expressing greater modesty, uh, less, less attention drawn to the, the actual physique of the man by having it covered with a longer coat. Um, why do you think you don't hear stories in movies like this about the Chabad community? Well, what's to say there won't be a story or a book or TV show sometime soon? This seems to be all the rage. Like I said, people have an absolute fascination with the, with the Hasidic, um, which is very exotic birds. What can I tell you? Um, there have been articles, uh, there, there have been instances um, but I think I would like to believe, and I'm sure again, that this is not 100% true across the board, because like in every other community, of course, there are families that are less functional and there could be discord and so on and so forth. But I think that because the Chabad community really philosophically remains porous and uh, open and embracing of all children, irrespective of what life choices they uh, they choose, I think the children are able to understand how much this means to their parents and are less likely to want to hurt them with a public expose. That might account for it. But like I said, anything could happen tomorrow. Uh, coming from the Holocaust, why would they have women shave their heads during the Holocaust? It was demeaning and women felt horrible. Uh, Okay, so I, I understand the question, why would you do something to women in a community that, had, that suffered so terribly during the Holocaust that would have such a um, strong association with what was done to degrade women and men during the Holocaust? I think the answer to that is because this was a custom they had in the old country. This was something that was important to them. It was a custom they had. And for them, the shaving of hair was not degrading. It was not demeaning. It was, it was what they did. It was how they lived. It wasn't meant to be degrading or demeaning. And I don't think that a Satmar man looking at his wife would see her as anything less than beautiful. Uh, so therefore, they did not give up that 
uh, they did not give up that custom. Why should they? Why should they have that usurped from them as well by the Nazis? Was the scene showing the young woman's sexual education accurate? Oh my Lord. Um, I'm surprised it took this long for us to get to this point. Uh, Cause I think that that must be one of the main things that really, really uh, struck the viewer. I, again, I did not grow up within the Satmar community. I cannot speak from having been raised in that community, having been taught by that kind of teacher and so on and so forth. Um, but my guess here is that it wasn't accurate. Now, I will say this. I don't think that the college teacher, the person in charge of educating Satmar young girls is going to show up with a banana and condoms. No, I don't think that's going to happen. But I don't think that uh, those dolls, <laughs> those stuffed dolls, uh, you know, the affected penis and so on and so forth, I don't think that happens either. I think that the amorphous terminology used in that first scene about um, the giver and the taker, if you remember that, I think that was a way of the teacher trying to gauge, well, how much does she know? What does she know? You know, and if this girl knows less, I have to be more explicit. But if she already knows what I'm talking about, then, you know, it, then, then I'll just be more modest about it. I'll, I'll just be more, um, I'll, I'll engage in the euphemistic. Now, what happens in this particular story, it seems to me, is that Esty does not understand, uh, but neither is she willing to let her teacher know that she doesn't understand. Uh, so that coupled with the fact that um, she suffers possibly, it seems, uh, some kind of uh, real sexual uh, pathology um, really makes for a very, very difficult uh, marital life or attempt at marital life. Um, but what struck me very much, uh, very, very, very acutely, and what saddened me was that I really don't believe that as sequestered and as insular as these people are, and as removed as they are from, um, you know, modern culture and so on and so forth, I don't believe that two people would not find their way because we're kind of hardwired and softwired. So if you put two little children on an island and they, were, they raised themselves, they would come to sexual pleasure with each other on their own. This is something you don't need manuals for. So I did not find his lunging on top of her into bed uh, realistic at all. It's hard for me to believe that nothing else happened between them. On the other hand, I, it is not hard for me to believe that neither one of them had a lot of, or that most of the young people in that community would have a lot of uh, sexual, not only sexual experience, but um, would have read or would have seen scenes and so on and so forth. So I think the initiation would be slow and I think it would be tentative and it might even be awkward. Uh, but like I said, I think this is something natural that all people come to. I don't believe that the hundreds of thousands of Satmar people in that community live lives bereft of sexual pleasure. Um, I feel bad that Deborah Feldman had this very, very unhappy experience. It, it you know, it, it is really, it's heartbreaking. It really, really is. Um, but I'm not convinced that those scenes were in any way a uh, depiction of what happens in most bedrooms. Now, might there be couples that need a little bit more time to figure out what they should do? And uh, might there be reticence in asking? Yes. And I'm sure that um, things have changed even from 15 years ago in terms of how they're teaching the young people and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that that was an especially um, grievous depiction. You know, it, it, it takes any and all semblance of humanity out of it. And, I, you know, I don't think that was lacking. Now, on the other hand, if you watched um, Unorthodox and you took that as, a, you know, a definitive <laughs> um, tutorial on Unorthodoxy, I think you would be right to come away with the impression 
that this hapless young man knew nothing about lovemaking and certainly not about arousing a woman. Uh, you could see that when he's in that brothel, uh, it's new to him. When, when she kind of guides him and shows him how to arouse a woman properly. Um, so in, in the story, that's one of the most endearing things about Yankee, that he, he really wants another chance because he feels as he's learned certain things that he didn't know before. Um, but it seems to me that I think most, most of the young people, maybe they might learn at a, at, they might know less at a certain point in their life but I would say they're probably quick learners, uh, will make it up to their wives. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't know that in Jewish law across the board, whether you're talking about modern orthodoxy, you're talking about centrist orthodoxy, you're talking about Hasidic or yeshivish or whatever, but in Jewish law, pleasuring one's wife sexually is an out and out obligation on the part of the husband. It's one of three obligations, primary obligations he has to his wife. Uh, so it's not uh, a woman's obligation and a man's privilege. It's exactly the opposite. And that's not something anybody would come away with when watching this. Are there any Chabad? Um, are there any Chabad doctors, women or men? Absolutely. Um, I heard the Satmar was like a mafia, them and another ultra-Orthodox group in New York City, as in they fought heavily between themselves when they separated. Okay, I think this question about um, the fighting between themselves when they separated. Uh, so a number of years ago, the Satmar Rebbe passed away. He left two sons. Um, and there was a lot of infighting between them. And I'm not going to massage this away. I'm not even going to try. Um, I don't know that they're like a mafia. Uh, but they are resourceful, they are passionate, and uh, they do fight for what they believe in. And historically, there was a time where the Satmar fought vociferously against the Chabad Lubavitch uh, sect, and it was not pretty. And that was over philosophical differences. Among them is the uh, extremely anti-Zionist uh, posture of the Satmar community, and they took great issue with the fact that the Lubavitch Rebbe uh, spoke so highly about the IDF and was so heavily invested in the safety and the well-being of Jews in Israel as he was in Jews all, all in their safety and well-being all over the world. Uh, so as Lubavitchers, we've had our fear share and uh, yeah, <laughs> let's just say that when they believe in something, they will fight to the hilt and it's not always pretty and there was some nasty infighting uh, between the brothers and their respective cohorts. I psychiatrically treated twin girls from your community. We saw the entire family together. The mother was clearly considered unimportant as a contributor for help. Is this the usual attitude or particular to this family? Um, I would say it's not. It's an unusual attitude. I would say that in most families, uh, both the mother and the father are considered extremely important contributors to the overall health and well-being of the family. Um, but it's possible that um, this particular mother had her own deficits that she was dealing with. Obviously, I know nothing about the case, but no, I would not say that this is a usual attitude at all. I will take this opportunity to say that um, one of the things that might be very startling to people when they when they actually come to uh, know Hasidic families is just how hands-on Hasidic men are, Hasidic fathers are. Um, very, very involved in the child rearing, very involved and could be very involved in cooking, in braiding the hair and putting the kids to sleep in the bath routine and so on and so forth. And that's, I think, something that flies in the face of um, the more general caricature. In these small closed communities, how do they address the genetic problems likely to occur? Um, interesting question. Um, I think that most Hasidic communities are very, very attentive to this. And uh, there's routinely genetic testing by young people even before they begin to, to date. And they will typically not date someone uh, who has a similar genetic deficiency or carries a gene uh, for an illness that necessitates that will that will transmit to the next generation if both 
the mother and father carry the gene. That's considered a deal breaker. So there's a lot of attentiveness to this. Having said that, um, you know, it's not unusual for cousins to get married in the Hasidic community. Uh, that's not, you know, across the board frowned upon. It's also not across the board touted as an ideal, but it does happen. Um, why can't they allow someone who doesn't want to shave their head to stay at their observant level? Uh, that's from Levi Levertov. Or maybe he's just sending me somebody else's question. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very good question, Levi or whoever this question is. Um, and I'm going to use this just as, uh, it's not about head shaving, okay? But it's about what kind of community do you want to build? What values do you want to nourish? And what do you want the ideal or the bar to be? So I will be maybe more transparent with you than I should be. Um, but I think like in Crown Heights, the, um, the home and the cradle of the Chabad Lubavitch community, uh, there's tension over this point because the community remains porous and wants to keep um, all of their children uh, within, the, within the, the embrace of the community, irrespective of their observance level. Um, this is very vexing to other people in the community who want their children raised in more of a cocoon. They want them raised uh, seeing a certain um, uniformity in, let's say, how women dress or, and so on and so forth, you know, by the modesty rules. Uh, and, and so this is a tension. Uh, so in the Satmar community, there's very little wiggle room for someone who won't conform. That is true. Um, and so the not shaving is just like kind of symbolic. It's emblematic of somebody who wants to rebel against the community. Because when you think about it logically, who cares what's going on under her, her whatever head covering she has, right? It's not something publicly obvious. But um, in that community, I think there's much more emphasis on weeding out any dissent at all, any nonconformity kind of has to be squashed. Just to jump in, uh, I am forwarding questions, so none of them are my own. And- uh, It's okay I, if they are. No, they're not. Um, there's, I see five more questions left on the chat. I say we stop after those five, and then if anyone okay. has more questions, uh, we can forward them to you or get them answers another way. Okay. Unmarried Satmar women do not have their heads shaved. Uh, because, again, according to biblical law, a married woman has to have her head covered. So the whole shaving is just kind of um, an outgrowth of the biblical commandment to have her hair covered. And then this is a very, let's just use the word extreme or vociferous way to make sure that will happen. Uh, let's see. When you say bring a child home, do you mean because Esti was pregnant? Oh, interesting. Uh, no. I, I wasn't so clever as to think of that double entendre. Uh, whether she would have been pregnant or not, they would have, I think, exerted a lot of, um, a lot of effort into bringing Esty home. The fact that she was pregnant, I think, made it all the more poignant and made it all the more important to her husband's family. Um, but I, wanna, I wanna make sure that um, I'm clear when, when, when I say that you know, it's, it's a different perspective. Like in Chabad, it's about keeping the child there. And for them, it's, it's also an expression of deep love. Um, but for them, the child would have to come home and conform. And sometimes that might be done through exerting fear. And I'm not touting that as a model. I'm just trying to explain. Are all marriages in the community arranged marriages? I think that um, with very few exception in the ultra-Orthodox communities of all variations, again, whether they're Hasidic or Yeshivish or um, even a lot of centrist Orthodox communities, most of the marriages are arranged. But I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, the butcher and the candle maker sitting in the back room of their shops and saying, my daughter is lame and you're your son doesn't hear very well, mazel tov, you know, this is a match. 
Uh, when I talk about arranged marriages, what I mean is that people are not dating, um, for the most part, they're not dating uh, for fun, okay? Uh, this is not, the, the word is eluding me here. Uh, it's not a sport, okay? It's not, it's not recreation, okay? Young people are dating when they want to get married and they want to build families. Um, they're not forced to marry anyone that they don't want to marry. They can meet 25 people, they can meet two people, they can meet 58 people until they meet the person they feel is the right person for them. Uh, I think what's very important about this is to understand that uh, typically they would only date when it was clear through doing some kind of speaking with people who know them that they share values, they share commonalities, that there's enough of a reason to believe that they could build a life together. Whether they actually like each other, whether they have chemistry, whether they jive, and so on and so forth, that's something that they would determine by themselves and only by themselves. And in contradistinction, and it's stark contradistinction to what you see in this mini series where they meet once for a few minutes with a whole gaggle of people waiting, you know, with cookies and drinks to bring out because this is a done deal. Um, this would really never ever happen um, in Chabad. Uh, people date, they sometimes date for a much shorter amounts of time than other people might think uh, is necessary. Um, it could be a few months, it wouldn't be a few years that they would date, uh, but certainly they would take the time to get to know each other and, um, and make a determination that they wanna make a life together. And I think the point of departure is different. It's about, it's about climbing in love rather than falling in love. So I think the young, the young people in our community uh, when they're getting engaged to each other, when they're getting married, they certainly are infatuated with each other. They're certainly excited to be together. They certainly like each other, uh, but they don't suffer the illusion, or maybe they do, but I don't think the parents suffer the illusion that they know what true love is. Um, but they do know that they're, that they're determined to build something long lasting and that this person, it feels to them like a person that they can build their life together with hopefully forever after. Um, I heard from a separate woman that many women these days do not shave their heads and they have a choice about it. Okay, could be. I'm getting a private message from someone. So um, I, I, like I said, that is altogether possible. Jews were actively persecuted, especially in Eastern Europe for a very long time. Why want to recreate a life copying those times? Nobody wants to recreate that life. Um, they want to recreate the joy, the meaning, the connection to God, the connection to each other. They're not looking to recreate the persecution. Uh, they have tremendously fond memories of the life they left behind, and they sought to recreate that for their children here. Because like everyone else, everybody always wants to give their children the best life possible. This, they believed, is the best life possible. SD sexual difficulties were psychologically based. It was implied that outside the community, she was sexually responsive. Her vaginismus appeared to have to do with keeping out the Hasidic life. Well, Marilyn, I, you and I, you know, will not be able to decipher exactly what ailed SD. Uh, many people who have critically written about this uh, series this mini series point exactly to this as uh, another example of what seems to be less believable. Uh, if she really did suffer vaginismus, then uh, why was she so quickly healed outside of the uh, Hasidic community? And if she didn't, and she may not have, it may have been all psychologically based, you know, that, that could be, that could be uh, the cause. Certainly, I agree with you that that's a very strong possibility. And especially, especially for women, you know, the most important sex organ is between the ears. Uh, so if she wasn't feeling comfortable, loved, cherished, if she wasn't comfortable in her own body, if she wasn't um, made to feel comfortable by her, by her husband who had very little uh, sexual experience, all of this could have contributed. 
Orthodox customs seem to continue for centuries regardless of whether they are needed today or not and whether they are Torah law or not, like head shaving or the exact style of dress. Have any customs from the old country been dropped? If so, who decides this and how is it adopted? Is there peer pressure to conform healthy? Uh, Penny, all very, very good questions. Um, <clears throat> first, you know, something you say here uh, kind of uh, tickles my funny bone uh, because I remember once um, speaking to a group of people and then afterwards when I took questions, one of them said, um, why does everyone in this community look like, you know, like, like penguins? And it took me a moment to understand that she was saying that all the men were, be were wearing black and white. And I remember, you know, doing my best to try to explain that to her. Um, and then I went back home to Binghamton and I was walking around campus and, it, and, and I looked around and all of a sudden it hit me every single kid was basically dressed the same. They were all wearing jeans and wearing one or two iterations of, or three of t-shirts. And they all had the same outerwear. I mean, all. So if you look at girls in a sorority today, they all, I promise you, have that same black coat. And it's all made by the same, by the same fact, by the same, uh, you know, it's the same name coat. So I think that people um, have a tendency to, to want to be part of a larger community, most people, whether they call it such or not. Um, so Orthodox customs seem to continue for centuries. That is true. Orthodoxy is marked by adherence, um, by, um, by transcendence. Um, but I think it's important to note that these customs are not just the result of OCD uh, or some fetish or boredom on the part of the rabbis. Like, mm, let's see what we can add here to make their lives more distinctive or more bizarre or more difficult. Um, each of these customs has a very deep root, um, has great meaning. And there's, there's a reason that if Moses came back today, he would have no trouble eating in any of these homes because he knows exactly that, that the laws have been kept all, all these years and will continue to be kept. Um, have any customs in the old country been dropped? I am sure many have been dropped. I am sure many new customs have uh, been adopted. Um, and who decides this? It's more organic than you would think. Uh, I think customs might spring up sometimes, uh, and you see this a lot geographically, like why do certain Hasidim have certain customs and others don't? Because it was some circumstance in that geographic location that gave rise perhaps to a custom. But here already we're talking about less important customs. But the bread and butter of Hasidic life, like of any Orthodox person's life, are really going to be the inviolable laws of the Torah you know, everything else is, is just to bolster those most important aspects of their life. Um, on, on this note, Penny, uh, I just watched a, a moving clip where a rabbi uh, reaches out to his community. He doesn't seem to be Hasidic, but certainly does look ultra-Orthodox. And um, he says, look, we've had so many young people get married in very simple, small weddings because of the COVID-19 virus. When this all passes, perhaps we should take this with us and not forget this time and think about how we might streamline these occasions and make them less expensive and uh, make it less onerous for those who don't have this amount of money. And I was very moved by his appeal. And I thought there was a lot of truth in that. In other words, the joy wasn't mitigated because there weren't, you know, a million people at the wedding and it wasn't $600 that was spent per head. Uh, so who knows, maybe new customs will, will, will arise. You know, there's been a lot of humor that came out of this virus. And um, maybe some of you have seen that same meme where um, in 60 years, uh, people are shopping for Pesach products and they're wearing masks. And the child asks their mom, why are we wearing masks? And she says, because that's our custom. Uh, so, you know, sometimes customs do spring up like that, but most often they're very deeply rooted in something transcendent, whether something mystical or something more exoteric, but something very important in Jewish law. Uh, 
I guess this is our last question. What about divorce? Uh, I don't know what you mean. What about divorce? I've already stated um, that this is not the Catholic Church, uh, that divorce is a possibility and has always been a possibility in Jewish law, um, that just as it's a mitzvah, it's a positive commandment for a man to marry. Uh, in the event that uh, marriage is no longer solvent, it's a mitzvah for a man to give his wife a divorce, to give her the get. Um, the ketubah, the Jewish marriage contract, is the world's most ancient premarital, uh, you know, um, agreement or document. Uh, in that respect, Jewish law is extremely progressive. And uh, look, it does say in the Talmud that the very altar of God cries, sheds tears when a couple gets divorced. Uh, so it's not a simple thing. It's not an ideal but certainly is sometimes necessary. And that is, you know, certainly understood. Uh, because it's not as common, I think there probably is more stigma attached to it. Uh, but it certainly is not something that's beyond the pale. Thank you. So nice seeing all of you, those faces that I can see. Did you have a closing uh, thought? A closing thought. Well, I could tell you um, that as a Hasidic woman uh, watching various depictions of communities that are not, you know, completely removed from my own, let us say, uh, being Hasidic myself. So whether it was Satmer, uh, you know, there was a stranger among us with Melanie Griffith, if you remember that a few years ago. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, her price above rubies, there's been all types of depictions. Um, and I've learned. Uh, from the inaccuracies that I'm able to very easily um, see that when I watch depictions of other communities, I should keep that in mind and not allow those depictions um, to form my definitive impressions and opinions about those communities because, again, I, I have to understand that they're not going to be accurate always. And, um, and even if the, the set is accurate, um, but there is probably a much deeper layer that I'm not understanding based on, based on that, you know, art piece that I'm, that I'm enjoying. Uh, so I, I've, I've learned a lesson from that. And uh, I have to say, every time there's one of these movies or TV shows, or whatever, I do take it very personally, and there's a lot about it that makes me cringe, and I worry that it will make it will make it that much more difficult for people to relate to me because of this. Uh, so I want to say in closing, thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you about this. Because any day, I take speaking about something with people over their being nice and not offending me and not asking me and um, coming to erroneous conclusions because of that. So thank you for the opportunity. This has been fun. Thank you so much for all of your uh, time and insights. I know everyone appreciate it. I got so many private comments and there's a lot of public thank yous. So thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, make sure everyone's aware that we have these daily Zoom gatherings every single day, uh, other than Shabbat and Sunday. And if you have an idea, whether it's your own presentation or someone else's, please do reach out and give us some ideas. We appreciate them. Uh, tomorrow is Alana Storch, who is a food blogger who's going to be sharing shortcuts to Shabbat, recipes from your pantry, so things that you can do just with whatever you have at home. And on Friday, we have a pre-Shabbat gathering with Eric Kay. So we really appreciate that. Next week on Thursday, we actually have a researcher from the ASU Biophysics Laboratory who's going to be speaking about coronavirus and the different research that has been done uh, throughout the world. So again, thank you all for joining. If you'd like to stay and schmooze like we love to do after these, I know today it's been a, an hour and a half, so I don't know if you have time to schmooze. You might Ouch. need a bathroom break. Uh, but again, you're welcome to stay on. I'll stay on and uh, we can chat a bit. Thank you very much. How great are Levi and Chani? Exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. Exactly my sentiment. They're pretty incredible. Yay. Everybody have a wonderful day and stay safe. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.